It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. Happy Independence Day weekend. I hope you're enjoying a nice long weekend away from the office. And with any luck, you'll be spending a good chunk of it outdoors, whether you're camping, hiking, paddling a raft, kayak or canoe, cooking on the back deck, or maybe, just maybe, going fishing. I got to do that last week at Lake Roosevelt, a huge 150-mile impoundment of the Columbia River in northeast Washington, where you can catch everything from trout and kokanee to walleye and bass and even sturgeon. I was there with the crew from Max Lure, and I got to spend a really fun morning in Richie Harrod's Lund boat trolling for walleye. Richie is the host of a great television show, The Northwest Outdoorsman, you can see across the Northwest and Midwest, and I'll tell you what, we got into the fish. In just a morning of fishing, we ended up catching 17 walleye and a nice smallmouth bass, and the vast majority of those walleye were perfect eaters, measuring 13 or 14 inches long, and and not only my family, but a couple more were very happy to feast on walleye in the days after. After that fun trip. This week on America Outdoors Radio, we've got fishing, hunting, and conservation on our mind. In the hunting department, we'll be talking deer and the best and arguably the worst rifle calibers being used out there to take them these days. Our expert weighing in on this, none other than Ron Spomer, that well known author, television host, and shooting dean who will be coming at us today from his home state of Idaho. We'll also talk about a different sort of hunting today. That would be treasure hunting, something you can do year-round with a metal detector. It's something I've started doing with my daughter lately, and it's really a whole bunch of fun. Debbie Smikoski with Mine Lab, a company that makes some very user-friendly and affordable metal detectors that you can buy at Cabela's and Sportsman's Warehouse stores, will tell you more about this hobby. On the conservation front, we've got the results of the spring waterfowl breeding survey from California, that state known for lots and lots of mallards flying into flooded rice fields. Melanie Weaver will share this year's numbers with us, which are a little concerning, along with how they stack up to previous years and how you, as a resident of California, can help bring more ducks back into the Golden Bear State. Also on the conservation front, we'll be joined by Lucas Leaf, the executive director of Sportsman for Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, who has some very good news about an environmental assessment by the federal government and a measure that can potentially save these waters from toxic pollution caused by nearby mines for the next 20 years. But we need your help to make this happen, and Lucas will tell you how you can help. On top of this, we've got another record fish segment for you and a little piece about a commonly eaten fish that you probably don't know a whole bunch about. That fish is the Alaskan Pollock. We'll tell you more about that species towards the end of our show. Before we get into that though, let's head to Minnesota and the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we're taking you to Ely, Minnesota. That's the gateway to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, a beautiful place located on the border of Minnesota and Canada. And we've got some good news with us here to tell you more about it is Lucas Lee, the Executive Director for Sportsman for the Boundary Waters. Lucas, welcome to the show. John, thank you so much for having me. So I understand that the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service did an environmental assessment, and they've just released uh, the results of that assessment and their recommendations. Tell us more about this. So back in October of 2021, the Forest Service announced a submittal for a mineral withdrawal application to the Bureau of Land Management. So that automatically triggered uh, the completion of a previously canceled two-year study. That study was just finished by the Forest Service, and they released their long-awaited draft environmental assessment on the proposed impacts of types of mining like sulfide ore copper mining upstream of the Boundary Waters Canaria Wilderness and roughly 225,000 acres of the Superior National Forest. So it's a huge deal. It's a huge step forward for protection of the Boundary Waters from this 
type of mining. And with that environmental assessment, the Forest Service also has put forth a recommendation for a 20-year mineral withdrawal in that proposed 225,000 acres of land within the watershed of the BWCA. So that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. And we've talked about this before, but let's go ahead and, and briefly explain to our listeners why this is potentially such a victory. Because a lot of folks are thinking, well, these mines are not going to be in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. They're going to be adjacent to it. You know, what could go wrong? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest worry here is the potential for acid mine drainage. It's called AMD. It's a pocket slurry of heavy metals, acid that uh, once leached, and generally these types of, of mines do pollute. Almost every single mine in the United States has in some form. It would flow directly into the boundary waters and up through Voyager's Park in the Rainy Lake and also Quetico all the way up to Hudson Bay. So it's a huge interconnected water-rich area of lakes, rivers, streams, and aquifers. And the potential from that type of pollution is devastating to both the aquatic and industrial ecosystems of the area. I am really glad that these two federal agencies came to the same conclusion that you and others who are proponents for the Boundary Waters came to as well. So that's their recommendation, 20-year moratorium. But Correct. before we get to that, I understand that now there's a public comment period that's open for 30 days. That's been going on for a few days now. What's the deadline for folks to have their voices heard and how can they make their voices heard? So, yeah, as you mentioned, John, kind of opened on Tuesday for a 30-day period only. So folks are going to have until July 27th, or about 30 days from that opening, to submit comment on behalf of supporting the 20-year mineral withdrawal recommendation. The best way to submit comment and support of that is through our website at sportsmanbwca.org. We have a petition ready for folks to sign that we will, you know, build the list of folks that have and submit it ourselves at the end of the comment period. And it's very important for everyone to comment on this because these federal agencies need to understand why from every level it's important for this special wilderness to be protected for future generations. All right. If folks want to actually read the environmental assessment, can they also do so from your website? Is there a link there? There sure is. Within our blog and a number of other things we've put up, you can easily go and check that out at the, the USDA Federal Register. So check our website. You can find the link to the draft environmental assessment, or you can search the USDA Federal Register yourself and, and find it there as well, which will also have a link notice for submitting personal comments as well during the comment period. One last question. What is Lucas Leaf going to be doing this summer for fun in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness? Whew. Well, I got two little ones, so we're going to be doing some first trips camping with them where we're actually getting them into a uh, tent. So they're two and a half. They've been up to the Boundary Waters a couple times just on hikes and whatnot. So first experience there and then in the fall for the Boundary Waters itself. Well, sounds like all sorts of fun. And one more time with the website before we go, Lucas. It's sportsmanbwca.org, S-P-O-R-T-S-M-E-N-B-W-C-A.org. All right, sportsmanbwca.org. That's the website to go to to find out more about the Boundary Waters Community Wilderness and make your voice heard in support of protecting it from mining. Lucas, thanks so much for sharing this good news with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you so much for having me, John. Today's news, I'm cooking a brisket. Let's go to Jill at my house to see how it's going. This is your house and you brought me and the crew to check on your brisket? That's correct, Jill. How's it looking? This is a Camp Chef Woodwind Wi-Fi. You know you, you can check your cook right from your phone, right? I didn't know that was an option, Jill. Well, never mind. But before you leave, can you feed the dog? What? No, no. When we 
we get back, why is my check engine light on? The answer may shock me. We've been telling you about Sportsman's Cove Lodge in southeast Alaska for a while now, and there's a reason. They are the only Alaska lodge we talk about on this show. It's because they're truly Alaska's best lodge. The adventure starts with a float plane ride from Ketchikan, after which you'll get the chance to experience some of the best hospitality, food, and wonderful people you'll ever meet. Wildlife is abundant, from bears and deer to eagles and whales, and let's not forget the reason you're here, the fishing. Halibut, salmon, lingcock, rockfish, true cod, and more. It's all waiting for you in abundance at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book your trip today at alaskasbestlodge.com. That's alaskasbestlodge.com for Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nationwide nonprofit organization dedicated to providing hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under who suffer from life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. These adventures make big differences in the lives of those who participate in them, and in many cases are literally a dream come true that brings hope and therapy to their lives. Find out more, get involved, or donate today at huntofalifetime.org. That's huntofalifetime.org. Huntofalifetime.org. Come explore the Dalles in Oregon for outdoors fun. Hike amongst the wildflowers, bike our riverfront trail, or visit the Gorge Discovery Center where you can enjoy a live raptor display. Or even check out our National Neon Sign Museum. But don't forget the fishing. We've got salmon, steelhead, bass, walleye, and monster-sized sturgeon waiting just for you. When the day is done, tell those tall tales at one of our wineries, breweries, or restaurants and plan your next adventure. Find out more at explorethedalles.com. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. Our next stop is California. They just completed their annual waterfowl breeding survey, and the numbers are pretty interesting this year. With us here to tell us more about it is Melanie Weaver. She's with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Melanie, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So what are the results of this year's waterfowl breeding survey, and how do they compare to the last one done before COVID in 2019? Well, we conducted the surveys in April and May, and we found, to no surprise, that our total breeding population in the survey area was down 19% from our last survey in 2019. And with the focus on mallards, um, because that's our most numerous nesting duck in the state, they were down 25%. Oh, wow. That's not good news at all. Now, long-term, how are these numbers, if you compare it to like a 10-year average or longer? So if you look at the long-term average, and that goes back to 1992 when we redesigned this survey, we've actually been counting ducks in the state since the late 40s, but the survey was redesigned in 1992. So if you look at the long-term average for that period, uh, mallards are down 45% below the long-term average. Another popular duck in the state, gadwall, below 11% long-term average. So, you know, not doing all that well, but there were a couple of years in the early 2000s that really bumped up the averages. Right. Um, So there's some imprecision in the survey. And two of those points that I was talking about that were extraordinarily high in those years, kind of anomalies. It just happens for whatever reason. We can't really explain it, but it wasn't the usual that we, we saw on those particular transects. So, um, you know, there's just some imprecision in the survey. Here's the next question I have for you. Why is this decline occurring? Is it a loss of habitat or is it drought conditions or both? It's both. It's both. You know, we, we've been suffering with a drought for a few years now. You know, we, we went through another one, and I think that was 2012 through 2014, and um, we probably never really fully recovered from that. And here we are again in the same situation, combined with a change in agricultural practices. You know, there's some ag that's wildlife friendly, and there's some that's not. And uh, unfortunately, right now, profits are higher in the non-wildlife-friendly agricultural practices. No, I understand that. We'll get more into that in a minute. Before we do, though, I mean, this is the local population of ducks we're talking about that hunters are going to be having, pun intended, a shot at until, I'm guessing, 
you know, through November, maybe early December. But then those northern birds should be coming down from Alaska and Canada. Any data so far on how those northerns are doing in terms of breeding surveys? I have not seen any initial reviews of habitat conditions, but I do know that uh, Alaska is average to above average of their snowfall. So that's really good, right? We get a really good chunk of birds coming from Alaska. So we know their habitat conditions, at least in the springtime, were, were very decent. So that's good news. As you move a little bit east into Canada, where we also get a significant number of birds, Alberta and Saskatchewan, not as good as the habitat in Alaska. I think portions of Western Canada, so that would be British Columbia area, they did have average to above average snow, but then Southern Alberta was drier than average. So hit and miss in those areas. And then of course, you've got the the prairie portion in the United States. And I think much of that area also was below average. Well, not sizing up to be a, a great year, it sounds like, in a lot of the United States, particularly in California with the local duck populations there. There's not a whole lot you or I or anyone else can do about the weather as it affects us, but uh, there are things that potentially we can do about the habitat. Now, does California have any programs to incentivize landowners to set aside wetlands or use ag practices that are a little bit more waterfowl and, and wildlife friendly? Well, we do have a handful of programs. A couple of our more recent started programs. The first one, however, was started back in 1993, and that's just a focus on our wetlands in the state. And it's an incentive program that provides financial incentives to landowners that have wetland habitat, and we pay them to maintain that habitat on the landscape. And do you have to be a farmer to benefit from that? No. Any landowner? No. Any landowner, and that is targeting um, semi-permanent and seasonal wetlands. So that's not an ag. Those are targeting wetlands. Our next program that was created in about 2018 is the California Winter Rice Habitat Incentive Program, recognizing that our waterfowl gain a significant portion of their energetic needs from rice that's cultivated in in the Sacramento Valley largely, and shorebirds too. There's other water birds that depend on flooded rice. So recognizing that we've kind of lost some of those acreage from historic highs over time. So the legislature approved this bill, and it's an economic incentive to landowners um, to flood rice fields for a minimum of 70 continuous days during the winter. How can people listening today that might be landowners or have friends who are landowners with wetlands find out more about these programs? They can go to the department's website and do a search. It's under the Comprehensive Wetlands Program of the department in the lands program, and they administer these three incentive habitat programs. They actually administer it. You know, they work closely with the waterfowl program, which I lead, but their focus is habitat. So if you go to our homepage and and do a search on the Comprehensive Wetland Program, it'll take you there and they'll be able to find out how to sign up or get more information on these programs. And we also have one last one that I did not mention. This was newly created as well. It's the Nesting Bird Habitat Incentive Program. The legislature created this, I think, around 2018, but it didn't have a funding mechanism. So last year, the legislature created a surcharge on both the duck and upland game hunting validations or stamps. And so that surcharge goes into a pot of money and its sole purpose is to benefit nesting ducks, upland birds, pollinators, and other grassland dependent species. And it pays landowners to cultivate or retain upland cover crop on their fields that otherwise would be fallowed in this time of the year. All right. Well, again, numbers are down in California, but as you just heard, there are some ways to turn things around through better habitat use. And I hope some of you listening today will take advantage of some of these incentive programs in California if you live there to help out the waterfowl. Melanie, thanks again for sharing this with us today on America Outdoors Radio. Thank you. Speaking of farmers and others who own ag lands, you know those folks have a lot of tools. And you need to have sharp blades, whether we are talking about big tools or small tools that you might have in your shop that maybe you use in your garden. And that's where the powered knife and tool sharpeners from WorkSharp 
come in so handy. They've got all sorts of different ones. My personal favorite is the Ken Onion Edition Knife and Tool Sharpener that uses abrasive belts. It's handheld, it's electrically powered, and you just hold it in your hand and you can use it for just about any angle you need on any tool you have from lawnmower blades to hose to shovels or whatever else. Check out the Ken Onion Edition Knife and Tool Sharpener and all the other knife and tool sharpeners available, both manual and powered, at WorksharpTools.com. That's WorksharpTools.com. Or look in a quality sporting goods store, hardware store, or ranch and home store near you for WorkSharp products. We are the young minds that will shape tomorrow's world. But today, the world is in your hands. What's your vision for the future? Ducks Unlimited has had the same vision for over 75 years. A future with clean water, abundant wildlife, and plenty of places to enjoy nature. There's a lot of work to be done, but with a little help from you, our future is looking really bright. Ducks Unlimited, working for conservation for generations to come. A public service from Ducks Unlimited. Hunting and fishing are exercises in hope. Before you head into the woods, you hope to tag out on a deer you'll have to field dress. Before you make that first cast, you hope for a big fish to clean and fillet. When your hopes are realized, you'll need a sharp knife. Whether you sharpen that blade on a power sharpener in the shop or a manual sharpener in the field, WorkSharp has the tool for you. Look for WorkSharp products in sporting and stores near you or online at WorkSharpTools.com. You're back in with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got Ron Spomer on the line, that very well-known writer and television show host and conservationist and hunter and naturalist and the man I consider to be the dean of all things when it comes to deer hunting and shooting and rifles. Ron, welcome to the show. No, thanks for that the little excessive build-up there, John. I don't hope I don't have to live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> you always do. I am not worried about that. You know, fun topic today. There's a lot of deer rifle calibers that have been in use for, we're going to say, like 100 years now. Some of them probably need to be put out to pasture. And, of course, there's always up-and-comers that folks ought to take a look at, too. Let's talk about one caliber in particular that you really think needs to be put out to pasture and just not used anymore. Oh boy, you know, this is stepping in it because everybody loves something that you might not. And I hate to, oh boy, take them off. And the reality is that everything works within the parameters of its ability and yours. So I won't say that every card trick that I know particularly like should be thrown out of the pasture. But boy, one that I would like to see go away is the 7.62 by 39 Soviet or Russian at AK-47 cartridge. That's gotten fairly popular over here, and yeah, it'll actually shoot downrange a little more effectively than the 30-30, but the power is right there with it. 150 grain bullet at around 2,100 feet per second, perhaps. And I don't know. I just don't like the idea, especially this day and age, of supporting a Soviet cartridge. I'm an American. By golly, I'm going to shoot a 30-30. It's funny you mention the 30-30 because I thought for sure that was the caliber that you're going to say that needs to be put away. Because the, the ballistics of that isn't nearly as good as a lot of other calibers that ours oh, are firing today. Yeah, yeah no doubt. But I think what we have to remember is we don't shoot the 3030 because of its ballistic performance. We shoot it because of the rifles that it's chambered in, its traditions, and its effectiveness within its range, 150 yards, maybe 200 with an experienced shooter. And that's where most deer are shot by most deer hunters in this country, with the exception of mule deer. But whitetails, blacktails, heavy cover, that old 3030, even though it's a bit of a dog of a cartridge, it's just extremely popular. It keeps hanging in there. And even though it's been bumped off by Everything from a 308 Winchester on up to the 3378 Winchester Magnum. Not too many of us want to walk around the woods shooting a 30 by 378. So that 3030, even though it's an old dog, it's going to hang around for another hundred years. What are your thoughts on the 243 Winchester, especially when it comes to deer hunting? 
Oh, I, I love it. I use it a lot. Obviously, it's a fairly light bullet, but it's flat shooting. It carries more energy downrange than the 3030 does. And uh, there's not a heck of a lot of difference between a 100 grain bullet and a 150 grain bullet, especially when you've got more energy in it. And if you get the right construction, those bullets can just do wonders. I have taken a lot of deer out to 300, maybe 350 yards with a 243 Winchester and the older, well, it's not older, but it's more powerful, but not as popular, six millimeter Remington. But these days, I think the six millimeter Creedmoor is going to come on strong and give the 243 a run for its money. But I think the 243 Winchester has been around for so long and it's such a standard that it's going to be one that's always with us. And I just think it works great for deer hunting. Okay, well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Give me another dog that probably needs to be put down. Oh, boy. You know, we can go really light with the 22s. A lot of states, you can use centerfire 22s for deer hunting, and a lot of guys do it. And even though it's not really a dog, I think the 222 Remington is going by the wayside just because the 223 is more ubiquitous and a little more powerful. Similarly, the 218B, that was a fun little lever action cartridge, but in a 22, it's too weak, and then that flat nose bullet that they used in those tubular magazines makes it even weaker. It only has about six to 700 foot-pounds of energy at the muzzle, let alone downrange. So I don't think anyone needs to be hanging on to that one too much longer. But on the other end, is the 7 STW. That one is a full-length magnum-sized case. It's essentially the 375 H&H neck down. And while it does perform wonderfully, there are other 7 millimeters and 28s now that I think are, are more efficient, and they got rid of the belt, and a lot of people don't like the belt and everything. So I could see getting rid of that 7 STW in favor of the 28 nozzler, for instance. All right. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. If, you know, a new deer hunter came to you and said, I want to buy mm-hmm. my first deer rifle, I know how to go and, and sight in a rifle, and I'm a decent shot out to a couple hundred yards, what would you recommend for him? 7 millimeter 08 Remington. A lot of folks think that's kind of, kind of a nothing cartridge. People will write me and ask if I think it's powerful enough for deer. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> it is more powerful than the 7x57 Mauser, also known as the 275 Rigby. And that's what Caramojo Bell used to hunt everything in Africa. He took 800 elephants with that 757. Wow. So if that could take an elephant and a Cape Buffalo and all the other big stuff he took over there, we can certainly take whitetails with it. I just think it's a beautifully balanced short action cartridge that has everything a deer hunter wants. It, you can use a fairly short barrel and get full energy out of it, full velocity out of it. It shoots a little bit flatter, drifts a little bit less in the wind than a 308 Winchester. It's essentially the 308 Winchester neck down to seven. So you've got more efficient, more aerodynamic bullets and a lighter weight. So there's a little less recoil, too. That'd be a big one. And the other one I'd probably say, and most people are, well, some people are going to say you're nuts, but 6.5 Creedmoor. <laughs> Even though people love to hate that 6.5 Creedmoor, it's essentially the ballistic twin of the 6.5 by 55 Swede, which has been a proven cartridge since 1892. Caribou, brown bears, moose, they hunt everything with it. And if it can do it, the same bullets from that 6.5 Creedmoor can do it. But you need to get it in a hunting rifle, not one of these long-range target rifles. Something that you can carry in the woods and the fields and mixed habitats comfortably. And then you've got yourself a heck of a deer cartridge. Well, I'm glad I picked that one for my Henry Long Ranger. I feel better there about my go. choice now. <laughs> He's the uh, Long Ranger shooting accurately for you? Let's just say the rifle shoots fine. It's the shooter that uh-huh. needs a little bit of work. Oh, well, I tried one in a 223 Remington. I thought, this is kind of silly, a lever action in the Remington 223. I shot that thing under three-quarter inch groups at 100 yards with factory ammunition. Holy mackerel. Out of a lever action. Isn't that something? Well, that's why you're the dean of shooting, and I'm just an intern. So let's oh, move I, on to one more thing I here. I don't know. <laughs> What's going on in the world of Ron Spomer that folks ought to know about, whether it be television or blogs or articles or whatever else? <laughs> Well, we've got uh, RSO TV on which we're doing some hunting videos, but lots of shooting videos that we can't necessarily show the details on the social media channels. They're always canceling things and stuff. So in order to really show a good gun review and lots of shooting and stuff, we're starting to push those over to RSO TV. And you can find that on our website, ronspomeroutdoors.com. But it is a subscription service. 
because we don't get any advertising dollars the way one does on YouTube for making videos. So it makes it a losing proposition if you don't get some somehow. But we figure it's fairly reasonable, $5 a month, and you can watch all the shows on there in perpetuity. So go for it. And then the other thing, of course, is we've got a podcast channel now, and we also broadcast that on YouTube. So if you want to sit there and watch me talk into a microphone, <laughs> you can go to YouTube, Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcasts. But that's kind of fun because I'll get a guest on every once in a while. We'll go back and forth the way you and I are now about topics like this. And I also read some of my old stories. A lot of guys that work in with their hands, they like to listen to my old magazine articles that I read on the podcast. So that's kind of fun. Then there's the standard YouTube channel. So Okay. Look for the Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast channel on YouTube or go to Ron Spomer Outdoors and consider subscribing and getting all sorts of knowledge about rifles that you're not going to get elsewhere. The website again, ronspomeroutdoors.com. Ron, thanks as always for sharing your wisdom with our listeners on America Outdoors Radio. You bet. Always my pleasure, John. This portion of the show is brought to you by Henry Repeating Arms. And if you're looking for a deer rifle, they've got a whole bunch of them. They actually have over 200 different rifles and shotguns in their lineup. Just go to HenryUSA.com and check them out. You'll find that all of them are made in America. They're all rugged, reliable. They shoot straight and have a lifetime satisfaction guarantee. And as for deer rifles, you'll find lever action rifles from Henry in the tried and true 3030, as well as in the Long Ranger series, the 243 Winchester, the 6.5 Creedmoor, the 308 Winchester, and in the new Long Ranger Express 223. Check them all out today and find an authorized dealer near you at HenryUSA.com. And don't forget to ask for your free decals and catalog while you're there. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nationwide nonprofit organization dedicated to providing hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under who suffer from life threatening illnesses and disabilities. These adventures make big differences in the lives of those who participate in them, and in many cases are literally a dream come true that brings hope and therapy to their lives. Find out more, get involved, or donate today at huntofalifetime.org. That's huntofalifetime.org. Huntofalifetime.org. Ready to step up to a quality-built rifle or shotgun that's a true classic? Check out Henry Repeating Arms, American-made. There's over 150 models to choose from in a variety of finishes and calibers for hunters and target shooters. Many of these are lever-action models with a classic look right out of the Old West. Don't be deceived, though. Henry Repeating Arms are modern, rugged, reliable, and have a lifetime guarantee. Find out more and order a free catalog today at HenryUSA.com. That's HenryUSA.com. Country hunters and anglers. You may have heard of us, but what are we about? BHA is the voice for your wild public lands, waters, and wildlife. From national level policy work to boots on the ground projects like public land cleanups, we work across North America to uphold the legacy of our public lands and waters, as well as your opportunity to hunt, fish, and recreate on them. Stand up for public lands and waters and become a BHA member today. Visit backcountryhunters.org. Sportsman's Cove Lodge in Southeast Alaska is booked for the season, which means now is the time to book for next year. And you'll want to do so soon because at the end of a typical summer, the lodge is over 80% booked. The reasons? The great fishing, the wonderful location, the comfortable accommodations, the fantastic food, and the over-the-top customer service. You'll find it all at Sportsman's Cove Lodge. Book today at alaskasbestlodge.com. Next up on America Outdoors Radio, we've got something a little bit different for you. You know we talk a lot about hunting on this show, but usually we're talking about hunting for birds and animals. But you know there's other hunting to be done too, especially if you have a metal detector. That's why we've got Debbie Smikoski on the line. She is the business development manager for Mine Lab. And a lot of folks just call her Debbie from Mine Lab. She's a very helpful person. She loves to drive around in her Jeep Wrangler and use her metal detector all over North America. Debbie, welcome to the show. 
Thank you, John. It's good to be here. So I actually just got a hold of a Vanquish metal detector from Mine Lab, and it was really funny because I think my daughter, who's 19 years old, was more excited about using it than I was. She wanted to go out immediately and put this to use, and we had a great afternoon together. Found some coins. I think we found a grand total of 26 cents in a state park, and a few other items, too. It was just kind of a fun afternoon together. Gotta ask, how popular is this hobby of metal detecting in America? It's actually really popular, um, and it's grown exponentially over the last couple of years, um, especially with people having to social distance and things like that. You know, people want to get out and do something, and this is a safe thing that they could do while social distancing. I've got to ask, what is the coolest thing you have ever found with your metal detector? My two best finds would be my, um, I found a voluntary militia button from New Hampshire, as well as a barrel to a pepper box gun at an old mining camp. Okay, that is impressive. Now, my daughter quickly educated me that there are certain rules you have to follow when it comes to finding things and taking them home when you're using a metal detector. Uh, You just can't go everywhere you want and take home everything you want. Let's start off with private property, either private property you own or you have permission to be on. It's anything goes there, isn't it, in terms of anything you might find? Correct. Correct. All right. So anything on private property, as long as you have permission to be there, you own it, you find it, it's yours. Finders keepers. Now, it's completely different with government-owned lands, isn't it? Yeah, it's very difficult. A lot of places that you would want to detect are federally protected. A lot of the battle sites, you know, from the Civil War and that, so you cannot dig on those. And in a lot of state parks, you're not allowed to dig. And it can change from city to county to state, so you're always best to check before you go detect somewhere. Right. You know, I live in Washington State, and it turns out you can fill out a a form online and print it out, and you can metal detect in most parks as long as you have this form with you. So that was nice to know. But on the other hand, if, you know, we were thinking of going to an old mining camp on Forest Service property, and correct me if I'm wrong here, my daughter was telling me, well, Dad, if you find anything that's over 100 years old, you have to leave it there. Is that true? I think it depends on, as far as I know, it depends on the state of what their rules are. Okay, okay. So bottom line is definitely check out the rules for the state that you live in before you get out there and start metal detecting and and bringing stuff home. Uh, Let's talk about metal detectors. They've come a long ways. I remember using some, you know, 20 years ago, and quite frankly, it was a little bit difficult for me to use. It wasn't that user-friendly, but this Vanquish 340 that I have or 540 that I have, it's very easy to use. It even tells you what you're likely seeing down there with some icons. Tell our listeners more about the Vanquish and also the Equinox 800 that you sell in Sportsman's Warehouse stores and Cabela's stores all over the country. Well, the Vanquish and the Equinox are two of the newer units that we have, and they're running what we call multi-IQ. And basically what that means, it's running simultaneous multi-frequencies. Easiest way for people that don't understand that is if you're fishing and you have a fishing pole with one hook and you have a fishing pole with five hooks, you better the opportunity to catch more with the five hooks. So that's what the Vanquish and the Equinox are doing is they're running multiple frequencies at the same time. So it gives you an overall greater chance of finding more and different kinds of things that other detectors might not hear. Interesting. And again, getting back to those icons and the numbers that you see, at least on the Vanquish I have, if it's a certain number like from 0 to minus 9, it's probably not anything you're going to want to be digging up necessarily. But there's certain frequencies. I think it was like the number 29 through 31. It's almost always a quarter. I mean, I didn't know you could like dial it down that specifically. Well, when you get up into the high 20s and 30s and you get that high tone, I'm sure you heard. Right. That's a really good tone because that could also mean silver. Ooh. So your older, you know, Mercury Dimes or uh, Walking Liberties, you'll hear that high-pitched tone, and that's usually an indicator of a coin in silver. All right. Well, you're making me want to get out there and look for that particular frequency again in the very near future, if not this weekend. You know, let's talk a little bit more about metal detecting. Are there a lot of clubs around the nation, or is this something that just people tend to do individually? There are clubs all over the country, and usually in your area... I was just up in Pondere, Idaho, yes. doing a hunt for a Spokane club. They have seated hunts. What I tell people is when they get a detector, it's always helpful to join a local club because not only can they tell you the rules where you can go 
and where you can't go. But there, it's a it's a group of people that are just very passionate about the sport and want to help you and want to see you succeed. So that's the best way to, to go about it when you first start out. All right. Any other advice for beginning metal detecting enthusiasts that you'd like to share? Just have fun. I mean, it's, it's a great thing. And once you, you know, once you find your first silver coin or there's all different treasures that can be found and you never know where they're going to be. So don't give up on it and you should have a blast. Okay. Well, Go ahead and check out the line of metal detectors from Line Lab. Again, you can find them at Sportsman's Warehouse stores and Cabela stores all over the country. They're in all sorts of other stores, too. If you just go to MindLab.com, look for the metal detector that interests you, and it'll have a, a little feature where it'll tell you exactly where you can buy it at a place near you. So Mind Lab products, whether it's the Vanquish or whether it's one of the other metal detectors they are easy to use they're lightweight they're fun to play with and i think you're going to have as much fun as my daughter and i did debbie thanks so much for sharing this with us today and have fun out there thank you so much and now it's time for one of my favorite segments it's time to talk record fish from ksat news we learn a texas angler may have broken a state and world record after he caught a monster fish out of the gulf of mexico last month the fish in question a giant 137 pound cubera snapper weighed in on june 3rd and the angler who caught it that would be Braden Sharon. According to the Port Arkansas Fisherman's Wharf, Sharon was free diving and spear fishing when he caught the snapper. The fish was weighed in at the Fisherman's Wharf by Captain D. Wallace. The all tackle world record for Cubera snappers was last set in June of 2007 in Garden Bank, Louisiana by Marion Rose. According to the International Game Fish Association, her catch weighed in at 124 pounds. And according to state fish records from the Texas Park and Wildlife Department, that state record was set on August 8, 1963 by Ricky Preddy. His catch weighed in at 131 pounds and was also caught in the Gulf of Mexico. The fishing company said Sharon's world record is still pending as he probably won't receive word back for a few weeks. As for Sharon... He is known as an avid spear fisherman who even has his own YouTube channel, something I think I'll have to check out. Congratulations on your new record. Last but not least, sticking with things to check out, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has an interesting podcast called The Fish of the Week that dives deep into a different fish species every week. Last week's Fish of the Week was the Alaska Pollock, a member of the cod family that you've likely eaten before, especially if you've ever eaten a McDonald's filet fish sandwich. That's the fish you were eating when you nosh on that tasty little sandwich. You'll also find Pollock used in fish sticks, sold in grocery stores by Trident Seafoods and Gorton. As you might imagine, they are caught in the waters surrounding Alaska, and if you want to take that deep dive into this species, you ought to check this podcast out. Out. Again, it's the Fish of the Week podcast by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. On that note, we're going to wrap things up, but I do hope you get to enjoy a fun Independence Day weekend. If you're lighting off some fireworks, please do so safely. Remember, you cannot do so on our public lands, whether they're Forest Service lands or BLM lands or state parks. Stay out of those places with fireworks. We don't want to start any forest fires. And wherever you're using them, make sure you've got some water handy that you put those fireworks in that water when you're done. And like I said, just be safe, but have fun. Another thing you might be doing this weekend is some cooking on the back patio. I know that's on my list of things to do, and I'll be doing it with my Camp Chef Grill. And you might want to do the same if you're looking for a Camp Chef Grill. Sportsman's Warehouse actually has pellet grills this weekend. Discounted $100. That's quite a deal there. No matter how you celebrate this 4th of July, I hope you'll also remember to celebrate the freedoms we all have here in America. We might disagree on a lot of things, and it seems that there's been a lot of disagreement lately, but we do live in a great country that was founded way back in 1776 with our Declaration of Independence. Here's hoping you are blessed in the days ahead, that you have a lot of fun out there, and that you do remember this. It is your country and your outdoors, so get out there and enjoy it. Enjoy it. 